not just famous for Newmarket, as in having been raised and raced here, but he also happens to be one of the world's most famous racehorses of the entire 20th century. Interestingly enough, the sculpture was made after he died. He lived from 1930 to 1960. Since the sculptor created this after he died, the mystery remains how did the sculptor make such a well-proportioned statue for the answer lies in the National Horse Racing Museum. You adapt to their movement, they don't adapt to you. I think I'm adapting really well. You are? <laughs> do, you, do, you want, do you want to adapt a little bit faster? Oh, I don't know! <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, this is like a workout. Do you want to try it a bit quicker? Oh, okay, I guess so. Sit down. Oh, that's a bit of a workout. Yeah, it is. 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 Balance. Oh my, that was. They wear a boot like that. Oh wow, okay. Very light. If you type in a name what you'd want for your horse, Weatherbiz would tell you. Weatherbiz do everything all the administration, registration, distribution of prize money. Yeah. They even do um, mm -hmm. race cards. So just if you type okay, in. Okay, let me just try one. Yeah, type in a name. Not available. Somebody's got that horse. Somebody's already. got that. That gives you the alternatives. Oh, so I could call my horse any of those names, you could but do. not Taurus. Or something else to type in. I bet you that's going to be taken. Not available. Oh, Pegasus, no, definitely. You know, <laughs> you know colours as well, you see. Ooh. So you can do your colours. Sleeves. Body. Body. Yeah, so what colour? Uh, let's go with. I do really like yellow. Are the most famous racehorses? Not available. You have to be really creative. A lot of the bigger owners might have a dozen horses in training, not necessarily with the same trainer. Like some people have two or three with one trainer, two or three with an owner. Um, and there could be five or six race meetings a day. In theory, they can have all their horses running on the same day at different race meetings. And they would all have to carry his colours. They all carry the same colours. So if I was like Lady Natasha and my colours were green and yellow, yes. then all of my horses carry... Would have to carry that. No matter how many horses you have, and even when you don't have any more horses, those cars are still yours. Until you sell them on to somebody else. Oh, and then they can wear the other person's They can wear them if they buy them off you. Uh -huh. But they, you, you act, they're registered to you and you only. So this post is interesting because it's explaining that there was a book called the General Stud Book that helped people identify which horse was which. To confirm the identity and pedigree of thoroughbred horses, the first volume of the General Stud Book was established in 1793. Requirements for identification of horses have developed since. So it's interesting that before passports and modern versions have been invented, that previously there was the General Stud Book that people used to confirm the pedigree and identity of horses, race horses. In 1990, a cedar tree at Hare Park Stud near Newmarket was blown down in a great storm, exposing the skeleton of a horse tangled in the roots. The skeleton was excavated in 2010 and samples were taken for scientific analysis to establish its identity. Look at the width of those neck bones. When horses travel, they actually travel with a passport, just like a human. Name, date of birth, a Weatherby stamp, the colour, identifying marks, vaccination records, country of birth, who the breeder is, and it allows them to travel to race courses. When travelling abroad, these passports remove the need for long periods of quarantine. Not too dissimilar from a human passport. There's a microchip inserted into the neck where it rests for their lives. I've now come to the Gallops, which is maybe a seven minute walk from the museum. And I wanted to just show you the kind of place where a horse like Hyperion would have been racing. 
In fact, he very well probably trained at this very hill. There is so much space here to train and from what I hear, there are up to about a thousand horses that come. Newmarket is considered to be the home of horse racing and that has been the case for over 300 years when King Charles II decided to make a holiday house here, a holiday palace where he could just enjoy a retreat with his buddies and just enjoy their horses, which is around the time that the lineage for horse racing began in the 1700s that we know of. So we can see here that these are the colours that the royals would use. So you could only use these silks or these particular um, clothing items with these colours if you worked for Her Majesty. So we started the video with Hyperion and I want to finish the video with Hyperion because his story is quite interesting. Of course he lived like a long time ago. And as we noted at the beginning of our little adventure, there's a beautiful rendition of Hyperion by the sculptor Skeeping outside the Jockey Club. Skeeping recreated this rendition of Hyperion using his well-preserved skeleton and you can still see his pure breed frame at the National Horse Racing Museum. But Hyperion's legacy left us much more to remember him by. He was purchased by Lord Derby. His father was Gainsborough and his father, he had won the race called the England's Triple Crown in 1918. And he had studied many racehorses. So Hyperion had many brothers and sisters that would have, <laughs> he would have probably been racing again. When Hyperion was born, he was actually a really small colt. He looked weak and he was kind of discarded and left to hang out with another colt that was the same age as him called El Capitan and the two of them you know just basically hung out and chilled together for the first year. Later a trainer, this is about a year later, a trainer called Lambton, George Lambton, he fell in love with Hyperion and he decided that Hyperion had potential even if he was to race as a pony derby because Hyperion only grew to about 15 hands. He actually stayed short even when he was fully grown. What was kind of ironic was that despite the fact that he was small and he looked weak, that he was given the name Hyperion, which means sun god. He was one of the, in Greek mythology, one of the 12 titans who was, you know, the brother of Aphrodite. And so he had this larger than life kind of character name or association. Um, yeah, he was, you know, supposedly this weak, weak horse. Um, that nobody kind of believed in until George Lambton came along and decided to, to train him. Now the funny thing about Hyperion was that it's possibly the fact that he had such a relaxed uh, first year of his life that he was quite calm and lazy and so George Lambton had to really push to get, to get Hyperion to work hard and to train hard to get him the same level where he could actually compete with other racehorses. So perhaps after only two years training and taking care of Hyperion, Lambton was told by Lord Derby, sorry, you know, you're getting old and your health is failing. I want somebody else that's younger and fitter to take care of his training. And so Lambton handed over the reins, so to speak, to a fella called Leader. So this new Leader guy was now in charge or managing Hyperion's racing career. So by now Hyperion was about four years old. I'm actually going to read from a wonderful article that I came across while I was doing my research here because it tells a really lovely story. You know Hyperion is now attending races or racing at the Coronation Cup, the Ascot Gold Cup and one interesting thing happened. Hyperion is at the Ascot Gold Cup and he was unfit for the distance and he had to be pulled up, he wasn't allowed to participate 
and it says that in the parade ring prior to the gold cup, Hyperion spotted Lambton, who was wheelchair bound at this time, and in a remarkable display of affection, stopped dead in front of his former trainer, refusing to move on for some time. I think that kind of loyalty, that kind of ability to recognize your former trainer and, um, and just want to be with him, I think that's just really quite lovely. Um, it reminds me of some of these stories you hear of dogs being really loyal to their to their owners and the one that comes to mind is that particular famous um, Japanese dog that wouldn't leave his owner's grave for a long time. I, I found that really a really touching story and so this this happened when Hyperion was four years old and so he's now nearing retirement. Apparently he disappointed a lot of his his followers who expected him to to be able to perform for longer than that. So after he retired, he studied 527 horses. <laughs> 527! That included seven winners of 11 English classics, as well as Kentucky Derby, Preakness winner, Pensive in the United States. So he went on to breed more winners. <laughs> To feel like you're part of this history, like to be able to sit on the same hill where he likely trained for his offspring that continue to potentially walk, trot along these same paths. It's quite lovely, isn't it? Guys, thank you so much for watching this YouTube video. I'm going to leave some information to the National Horse Racing Museum down in the description below. Make sure that you drop some comment in the comment section as well and let me know what is your favorite thing that you enjoyed from this video thank you so much also to stefan regular and to the national horse racing museum for hosting me